what church? So excited to see your face. Why don't you help us worship this morning? We're going to have a good time, all right? Clap your hands. Stand on your feet all the time.
our hands to the God of the universe who just can't lose. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm so thankful, God. In every battle, in every fight, even when we fail, he is victorious. So this morning, let's give him the battle. At this time, we're going to ask our prayer team if they would just make their way to the front. If you have a need in your life this morning, it doesn't matter how big, how giant, or even how maybe insignificant it might seem. Maybe it's an emotional thing you're dealing with, physical, financial, whatever it is. If you have a need, we just want to invite you to the front at this time to come and get prayed for, to touch and agree. The Bible says where two or three are gathered in his name that there he is in the midst. So if you would just step out in faith, if you have anything you need prayer for, just start to make your way forward as we uh, worship in this next song. Speak your name. 
Let's just take a second in his presence to just lift his name up. Jesus, name above every other name. There's healing and salvation in your name. There's freedom in the name of Jesus. Spheres change and situations change when we call the name of Jesus Christ over our lives. Well, it is so good to be in his presence. It's so good to see each and every one of you. It is a privilege and an honor to be in the house of God, to be in his presence. And I just don't, we just, we got to remember to be grateful for what we feel in this place. And so it's so good to see you. And before we get to the next part of our service, if you wouldn't mind just taking about 20 seconds turn welcome some people tell them hello let them know you're happy to see them um, and that god has something special for them this morning and then you may be seated Good morning, church. How are you guys doing today? Good. Are you enjoying the warm weather? Okay. Some of you are like, some of you are like that. So in February, when we're freezing and praying for this warmth, I'm going to remind you of that. But it's a good day to be in church this morning. My name is Beth, and I get to serve here on the First Impressions team at the 414 Church. So all the people that made you feel welcome in the lobby, the smiles on their faces, that is the First Impressions team, and we hope you feel really welcome today. If this is your first or second time here at the 414, we just want to welcome you here. We believe that you're here on purpose, and you're going to receive something powerful from God this morning. And we're honored that you would choose to spend your Sunday morning here with us. If you haven't done so already, after service, right through these doors in the entry is the VIP central table. So we have a lot of smiley faces waiting to greet you, and we have a special gift for you and your household as a token of appreciation for being our VIP here today. The 414 Church is a home where people are led to become fully engaged followers of Jesus, and we believe it's the most important decision you'll ever make. And the system that we use to deliver that message is simple, and it's really God's plan for all of our lives. As a church, we want to help you know God, find freedom, discover your purpose, so then you can go and make a difference in the world around you. So if you're new here today, or maybe you've been sitting here for a couple months and you haven't felt that nudge to go, this is your nudge, okay? We want to invite you today to join us for Growth Track. So Growth Track takes place every single Sunday in the lounge during second service at 1045. And this is a great time to just connect with the church, learn the vision of our lead pastors, and connect in community and reach your full potential. So every single week, if you're here today, you can plan to come and worship with us next week during first service, and then you can jump into growth track for second. All right, well here at the 414, we believe in the power of prayer, amen? Okay, that was weak, guys. We believe in the power of prayer. Prayer changes things. And we see that week in and week out. We love to pray with you and then celebrate you when we see God answer your prayer. And so today actually starts 21 days of prayer and fasting. And we come together corporately as a church and do that together. So for the next three Saturdays, we're going to meet here in this room at 9 a.m. and pray together. It's going to be powerful. You're not going to want to miss it. Probably the most important thing you'll do all week, if I'm being honest. If you can't make it, which you're going to make it, we'd love for you and encourage you to join us Monday through Friday. Church of the Highlands is doing the same thing. They're going to stream it at 6 a.m. So you can join on their stream. And if you can't make it at 6 a.m., 
I know all the moms are like, this is the last couple weeks of summer. It's okay. You can get it on demand all day long. We just ask that you would join, and we know that God is going to move during this time. All right, so Pastor Andrew last week shared some really exciting news with us, and that was that we closed on our new building this week. So many of you probably got to see it between services. If you haven't had a chance to get over there and see it, you can after service, but it's been amazing. It's just a testimony of God's faithfulness to us. And so we've been doing a ton of work. We've had crews there every single day. And guess what? There's more work to be done. (laughs) So many hands make light work, right? And it's fun. You're building community. You're sweating together, whether you're doing landscaping or pulling out the red carpeting piece. I was not sad to see that go. But we need more hands. And so you guys can scan the QR code behind me. Fill out the form if you want to join. Um, And then every single night, usually between 8.30 and 9.30, you're going to get an email, and that's going to tell you the times that each crew is going to meet for the following day and the jobs that they're going to be doing. Okay? Who's going to come? All right. So (laughs) we want to be known as a church who is the hands and feet of Jesus in West Dallas and really across this whole city. And so we have two outreach events coming up. Right now, we are in the middle of doing a backpack drive, so you probably saw the box out in the lobby. But we're going to collect backpacks, not school supplies, just backpacks for the children in West Dallas. And so if you would love to join and bless some kiddos, you can do that. You can bring your backpacks next week, or this will lead into my next announcement. You can bring them to our outdoor family movie night that's coming up on August 19th. So if you've been to the other ones, they have been a blast. It's an easy, fun thing to invite friends, families, your neighbors to. uh, Bring a lawn chair, bring your backpack and come have some fun with us. So before I invite Pastor Andrew up, we're so excited that he's back and and Pastor Shyla. They've been gone vacationing for the past month. So just give them some love on the way up. Let them know that you miss them. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? It's so great to to be home. It's so great to see you and uh, just be in service with you. I wonder if you'd do me a big favor and help me give our online audience a great big round of applause. We welcome you. So grateful you're with us today. I have a couple of announcements that I need to also make and and expand on or expound on, and that is uh, immediately following service, uh, Beth mentioned this, we do have an open house at the new building for those of you that haven't had an opportunity uh, to get over uh, there there, over there to, to look around, and so we encourage you to do that today. Just a few announcements, though. If you have children, uh, it is an active construction site, so keep them close. Um, I don't want to hear about any kids that stepped on, you know, uh, carpet tack strips and all that kind of stuff. Just, just keep them close to you, um, but go ahead and, and look around. And then uh, when you get into the, to the auditorium of the building... Uh, The platform is concrete. We pulled, as Beth mentioned, uh, the beautiful red carpet out uh, of that. And um, we've got Sharpies down there. And so I encourage you to go ahead, write your favorite scripture right on the stage. Um, Go ahead and write your name. Um, And then here's a real powerful thing I really encourage you to do. If there's anyone in your life that you know needs Jesus, go ahead and write their name because we're going we're to stand on that, proclaim the word, uh, preach God's truth. In fact, uh, there are some people in the room today that before we opened this building were not coming and attending church, had never said yes to Jesus, and their names are written uh, under this platform, and they're here today. So there's great power in that. And so I encourage you encourage you to do to do that, but uh, look around. This will be one of the few times that, that nothing is off limits. Uh, you can go look in every room once we get in there, obviously for security purposes. We'll have places that are closed off, but go ahead uh, and look around. And then uh, when the former church that was there moved out, uh, they left a lot of things. And so uh, what I wanted to tell you is as you look, we have two rooms. We have one classroom uh, in the kids' wing and then the cafeteria uh, on the kids' wing as well that is filled with all kinds of things. And so if you attend church here, if you give here, uh, you bought it. So take whatever you want, okay? I'm for, I'm for real. Like we've, been, we've had people in and out. And, and so if there's something that you see now, the caveat to that is there's stuff in the kitchen 
that we've actually pulled aside to keep the rooms clean that we're going to use. So you can't have anything in the kitchen, um, but in the cafeteria, in that classroom, if there's anything you want, if there's something too big, uh, we've got a pool table and all kinds of crazy things um, that, that you can't fit, but you need to make arrangements for. Just talk to, to Pastor Drew or Pastor Don, uh, and, and we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll make arrangements for you to do that. But, but encourage you, if there's anything that you can use, there's dishes and all, all Christmas trees and decorations. So for like, I'm not joking, take it uh, because it's probably going to be thrown in the garbage if you, if, if, because we can't continue to move stuff around. We got to get working on, on all of those rooms. So if there's anything you want, go ahead and do that. And then um, um, hopefully you filled out the QR code, but I have two requests. So tomorrow evening uh, at 6 p.m., I, I need 20-ish people that can help with landscaping. Uh, if you've got like a small chainsaw, uh, rakes, trimmers, um, we, we took care of one section uh, of the parking lot and that took about three hours. It was so overgrown. And so if you can do that tomorrow, let me see your hands. Hopefully we can get about 20. So one in the back. Thank you in the back. Two, three, four, five. All right. Um, thank you. Yeah, I see your hand. You can come. That's fine. Um, yeah, so so bring bring work gloves and, and all that kind of stuff. We're going to try to get that done, uh, obviously, weather permitting. If it's pouring rain, we will not be doing that uh, tomorrow, uh, but that, that is the plan for tomorrow. And then on Tuesday, now I have to be really careful here because I got myself in trouble uh, a couple of months ago when I was talking about getting uh, the pews out of the auditorium, and that is, I said, able-bodied guys. So I know we've got some able body women in here. So if you're able-bodied and you want, uh, Tuesday, I need 30 volunteers. We have all of our carpeting being delivered, all of the lumber being delivered for the projects. There's probably, I don't know, four or 500 pieces of lumber that are going to have to be carried in. It's an old building, so there's no, you know, like drive up where you can just dump it in. So come on, I need to see hands. How many of you can come Tuesday at six o'clock? Uh, Mo, you lifted up both. I can only count you once. I know you work hard, but all right, come on, hands, hands, hands. Let me see. All right. So that's going to be two Tuesday at six o'clock. Many hands make light work. I would greatly appreciate it. And then for the rest of uh, the rest of you, make sure you fill out the QR code as we have projects. We'll be sending those out. And some of you have framing experience and you communicated that to us. Uh, that'll start probably Wednesday this week. And so uh, we'll, we'll be getting in more information out to you uh, in the days to come. Just make sure you talk, uh, just check your emails. I know email isn't a big thing for a lot of people, but that's, we can't communicate with 80 people by making phone calls every time. So I need, I need you to, to, to jump on there. So uh, that is it as far as that announcement. Pastor Tiff, would you come up to the front? Shiloh, would you come to the front for me? Um, those of you that were here last Sunday uh, heard me announce that this, this weekend uh, is Pastor Tiffany's last weekend with us uh, here at the 414 Church. How many of you appreciate Pastor Tiffany? <laughs> And um, for, for those of you that may not be aware, Pastor Tiffany was married now three weeks ago, right? Three weeks, three weeks ago yesterday uh, to, to, uh, to Josh Cameron and his parents pastor a church in Racine. And so um, Pastor Tiff and, and Josh prayed about it, made, the dif- made the, a difficult decision. Uh, they, they both were going to have to leave someplace that they loved. One of the two of them was going to. And, and so they prayed about it and they feel like in, in this season that, that jam and Racine is where they're going to need to be. And so I, I just wanted to take a moment just to, to honor uh, Pastor Tiff and just thank her for really thank you for everything that you've done for us. Pastor Tiff has been here uh, for five years. So she was here in some of the really, really lean years where we would start worship service and There'd be 18 or 22 people in a 700-person auditorium, and uh, it's amazing to, to just think about what God has done, and you've been a big part uh, of that. Um, one of the things that happens is, is that, that we as people, we tend to applaud uh, the visible things uh, that we see in others. So Pastor Tiff is a great communicator. She's a great, obviously, uh, worship leader. She, she's great at leading the church in prayer. And so it's, it's very easy to applaud those, those visible gifts that happen during a Sunday morning service. But, but I, I want to let you know that, that what I love most about her are the things that you don't see uh, during a, a Sunday service. And Tiffany is a, is a person of passion, uh, she is one of the greatest examples of people that love Jesus that I've ever met in my uh, entire life. And um, uh, she prays. 
Um, lots of people can sing, but not a lot of people can lead worship. There's a difference there, and, and that's connected uh, to her prayer life. And so uh, this, this being her last Sunday, I can say anything um, about her. And I shared this in the first service, a funny story, but uh, about 18, 19 months ago, we had someone get into the building, and we found out was secretly living here. And uh, when we discovered that, we went to the security cameras and we're trying to find out, hey, how long have they been there? What have they been taking? And so I'm going through all of this footage. And so back here, we have a musician's closet. And in that room is a video camera. And um, I'm going through all this footage. And and all of a sudden, I I get to a Sunday. And of course, there's people in and out of the room grabbing their in-ears and their microphones all the time. But all of a sudden, uh, the camera sits on the windowsill. So it's about this high. And I see someone get like this close to the camera. Like, what in the world is going on? And then the next thing I see, they're like this, and their face is right in the camera, and it's Tiffany. And her face is right in the camera, like this far away. And she's just, she's praying over the service, and she's praying over you, and, and praying that God would move. And, and I told her, and she goes, she goes, Pastor Andrew, I was so mortified because as I was praying, I opened my eyes, and I saw this light, and she goes, oh my God, this is a camera. <laughs> And I told her that I was going to take the video and play it, but I'm not going to do that to her today. Um, but but she, she just, she, she's a prayer warrior. Um, um, one of the other things that Shaila and I admire so much about her is uh, she's used her gifts in the most difficult of seasons. And uh, most of you, if you didn't know her personally, would have no idea. Um, her relationship fell apart a couple of years ago now and, um, you know, just walked through a very difficult thing. Her father was her best friend, passed away with a years-long battle of, of cancer. And, and, and in every, every one of those situations, you know, Shal and I would go to her and say, hey, do, do you need some time away? Uh, did, you, did you just need to, to take a step back? And she just, she just always said, I just I need to be in Jesus' presence. That, that's where I'm going to be healed. That's where I'm going to be touched. And, and so we admire that so much about you. And I, I know even um, when my mom passed now just about two years ago, uh, it was watching your example of leading through the loss of your father that gave me courage and gave me strength and um, gave me an example to follow. So, so I want you to know that, that you've been a blessing not only to everyone here, but you've been a blessing to us personally. And so uh, we love you and we just thank you for everything. We've got some flowers for you. We've got a gift for you. Um, we're not going to take it back after this service. I had to take it back after last because you were coming in. Um, and we just, we just honor you so much. So hey, would you do me a big favor? Would you stand up? Uh, As you're standing right after service, um, Pastor Tiff will be out in the lobby, and so I know some of you want to hug her neck, uh, tell her you love her, um, but but, but would you uh, just help me pray over her, pray a prayer, a blessing over her? Amen, Charlotte. All right. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you. We thank you today for Pastor Tiff, and Lord God, we thank you uh, for the blessing that she's been over us. And while goodbyes uh, sometimes can be difficult, Lord, when we look, especially in this situation from a selfish perspective, the truth is that you have a great plan for Tiffany's life and for Josh's life. And so, Lord, right now, we just bless her. Lord God, I just pray the blessing upon her that she'd be blessed when she goes in, that she'd be blessed when she goes out. Lord, I pray that you bless her ministry. Lord God, I pray right now, we pray over her future family, Lord God. Lord, just all the dreams that you placed in her heart. Lord God, I know that this isn't the end. This is just the beginning. And so, Lord, we rejoice in that. Lord God, we rejoice in your kingdom being bigger than one church, Lord God. And so, Lord, I pray just blessing upon the Cameron family, upon Jam. And Lord God, I just pray that everything that their hands do, Lord God, that it would be blessed. And Lord, here's what I believe, that, that, that one day in eternity, there are going to be thousands and thousands of people that have said yes to Jesus because of the ministry of Josh and Tiffany. And so, Lord God, I just, I just pray your hand upon them. Lord God, bless their marriage. Lord, let your hand of protection be upon them. And Lord God, we're going to be quick to give you the praise, the glory, and honor. And we ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen, amen, amen. Would you clap your hands? Thank you, guys. I'll be very quick um, because I I said I had my ugly cry yesterday um, so that I wouldn't blubber. Um, but I'm just going to miss, um, I'm going to miss you guys. Um, I'm so thankful for our church. You know, I, there's a um, few places where you can walk in and feel so much love and feel the presence of God. And I'm thankful for every single one of you. Um, and I'm so incredibly thankful for Pastor Andrew and Shyla. Um, I just honor you guys, respect you. 
love you from the bottom of my heart. And, um, you know, as I was thinking and just about our church and some of the seasons that I have walked through, um, it's because of you guys and it is because of you. Um, even your kind words, looking out, seeing people worship, it's an encouragement to those who lead worship. Um, and Pastor Andrew and Shyla, every step of the way have been um, so prayerful to me, for me. Um, and in many cases, some of the things I walked through, and I've, I've told them this, but it would have been easy to say, why don't you just take a break? Or why don't you just, um, and you guys were consistently there to encourage and to pray for me. Um, and you really have been instrumental in keeping me, in keeping me path. Um, and I told them earlier, like, you'll never really know until you get to heaven. And I, I just pray that you have extra jewels in your crown. Um, and I'm so thankful, and our church is in good hands, and God has such an incredible future for this church and, and for the church at whole. And, and I don't plan to be a stranger. I love you all. Um, so I don't even really want to say goodbye if you can just say, let's see you later, um, because you are my family, and I love you deeply, and I'm so thankful for the kindness um, and the support that this church has offered to me. It's been an honor to serve um, and to be here. And I just am so thankful for, for every one of you. So thank you guys. Amen. Amen. Well, well you may be seated. You may be seated. Um, it's hard to transition from that. Uh, but we're, I'm going to do my best. So uh, someone told me before the first service today, there's like, I'm so excited to hear you preach. It, you haven't preached for six weeks. And I said, who's counting? And they said, I was. Um, and so I'm, I'm really, really glad. We're going to start a new series uh, today. I was uh, scrolling through social media uh, in the last couple of weeks, and, and, and I, I had um, dropped my phone here. Um, some of you have done that too. Uh, not in front of this many people probably, but... Um, but uh, I, one, one morning I woke up and I picked up my telephone and I did the worst possible thing that you could do, and that is I opened Facebook and I started scrolling. Come on, how many of you ever do that before you even get out of bed? Yeah, it's all right. Um, we, we, we're, all, we're all guilty of it. In, in, in a matter of moments, this is not an exaggeration, in, in a matter of minutes, this is, this is some of what I saw. I, I saw f uh, stories of floods and loss of lives in Kentucky. I saw and read about wildfires in California. I saw posts about the war in Ukraine. I saw posts about gasoline prices and inflation. I saw posts about unprecedented violence. I saw posts about record uh, murder rates. I saw posts about rumors of pending World War III with China. I saw posts about uh, stock market losses. I saw posts about ungodly and unbiblical and really even unthinkable things that are being taught to our children in public education. I saw posts about national leaders trying to get this spend us out of the financial mess that we're in. How many of you has that worked for you? Oh, just spend more money. That'll help me get more, right? You know, I mean, I just saw all this stuff. And, and I don't know if this ever happens to you, but, but for me, I, I, I got to this place. I was so overwhelmed. I just wanted to just throw my hands up. I surrender. I give up. It's hopeless. Come on. Anybody ever thought that listening to the news or, or scrolling social media? I, you know, like, what can I possibly do? And so, and so the calling to be salt and light in a world that collectively seems to have lost its my as my mom used to say, it's ever-loving mind, right? Um, it seems too much to bear, right? The knowing that God has called me, but looking at the plight of our situation, it seems too much to bear. And so in this series, I want to equip us with some, some tools that will help us succeed in our calling in the face of adversity as a church and as fully engaged followers of Jesus. Here's what I know with all of my heart to be true, and that is that God desires to stir each and every one of us up
up today in order to be a difference maker. And here's what I want you to know today. It doesn't matter how hopeless it looks on the outside. It doesn't matter how wicked seem, wicked the world seems to be. We are on the winning team. In fact, we just sang about it. We serve a God who has never lost a battle. He has never lost a battle. We are on the winning team. And so the Bible says in Romans 5.20, but where sin increased... So what is that God? And then going on, it says God's remarkable, gracious gift of grace, his unmerited, unmerited favor has surpassed it and increased all the more. Well, what is it saying? When I, whenever there's a lot of sin, there's a lot of God's grace. So even though the world we look at seems hopeless because it's so sinful and so wicked, we can hold hope to the fact as believers that where sin doth abound, grace does much more abundantly. And we need to know that we are on the winning team. And so to help us in this series, uh, we're going to be looking at the story of Nehemiah in the Old Testament. And so uh, before we start reading in Nehemiah chapter 1, I want to let you know that Nehemiah was not a prophet. He, he was not a judge that was uh, sent by God like some of the other uh, judges that we read about. He, he was not a king. He was not a, an, an army commander. He was not a mighty warrior. He was, he was none of those things. Nehemiah was a, a cupbearer to the king. He, he was a, a servant. And so, and so the cupbearer's job uh, was to sit in the throne room and then he would actually take the king's cup of wine and he would, he would taste the wine before the king drank it. How many of you are like, I'd like that job. Come on. It's all right. You can be honest in church. I, I, I saw some of you at state fair yesterday. I'm just kidding. I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> You're like, man, that's not a bad deal. I'll take, I'll take that job. Listen, I want you to understand the reason that job existed because in case someone tried to assassinate the king by poisoning, the cupbearer would take a drink first so that they would die instead of the king. Now, how many of you are like, yeah, that doesn't sound so good. Don't think I want that job, right? I mean, that's one job. You don't want a bad day at the office, right? You know, like, man, I drank that. It made, it made me so sick. And so, and so from the world's criteria, from the world's measurements, Nehemiah was really nothing special. He was a servant to the king. In fact, he was only in the kingdom that he was in because his nation had, become, had been taken captive and he essentially was brought in as a slave. That's where we're going to pick up the story. Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 1. It says, these are the memoirs of Nehemiah son of Hekelia in late autumn in the month of Kislev in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes reign. I was at the fortress of Susa. Hannah and I, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. So this was, this was Nehemiah's homeland. And I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. They, they said to me, things are not going well for those who returned to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. And so at the time of this story, the city of Jerusalem in the, in the nation of Judah had been conquered around 140 years earlier. And so the walls of this once incredible city had been destroyed, had been broken down. The, the gates had been set on fire. The, the infrastructure of the city had been destroyed. And so what was once this, this proud nation, in fact, the Bible tells us that, that they were really God's chosen people, the apple of his eye. They were blessed. In fact, God at one point said, I'm going to give you cities that you didn't build. I'm going to give you vineyards that you didn't have to plant. But because they had turned their back on God, God, God allowed the armies, the enemy armies to come in and, and basically take them captive. And now everything that they had was lost and laying in ruins. And while not in, phys, in, in the physical realm or physical nature, the correlations between Judah and our nation are actually worth considering this morning. We were a country, the United States was a country that was found on Judea, Christian values and freedom to worship. This once great, mighty, proud country is no longer a Christian nation. 
And that may surprise you, that may shock you, you may not want to hear it, but it is the truth. The United States is no longer a Christian nation. What was once a a proud, God-honoring, God-fearing nation is on the verge of collapse. And listen, that's why I believe that it is essential that you and I, that we stand up, that we rise up, that we get some backbone, put our shoulders back, and be the church and change the world. And so after years and years and years passed, what happened is, is some of the remnants of the, uh, of the nation of Judah began to return home after being conquered. And because the walls of the city were torn down and the gates were destroyed uh, in that day and age, it left them open and vulnerable to the outside attacks of, of armies and, 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 and little groups that would go through and plunder and steal. And so even though they were able to return home, they were depressed. It was It was kind of just like it is today. It was all bad news all of the time. The walls were destroyed. Their once majestic temple was just in ruins. They didn't have this majestic great place to worship. Uh, They felt like they they had no hope. And just just like I felt a couple weeks ago, many of them were probably like, just throw my hands up in the air. It's no use. We're never going to be what we once were. The whole nation, they were distraught. They were hopeless until one person. Turn to your neighbor and say, until one person. Turn to your other neighbor and say, until one person. Until one person, a man by the name of Nehemiah, a cupbearer, a servant, an ordinary guy, he had what was a Popeye moment. All right, so I need to talk to everybody that's over 40 in the room. How many of you know who Popeye is, right? Yeah, a bunch of you. Now, a bunch of you kids are like, I have no idea what you're even talking about. They're going to put the picture on the screen behind me. Popeye was a cartoon character whose arms were bigger than his thighs. Yeah. And Popeye had this, this enemy, and his enemy was a bully. His name was Brutus, and, and Brutus would always try to steal his, his beautiful girl, Olive Oil. And so what happened is is Brutus would push him around. How many of you remember this, right? Brutus would push him around, and he'd push him around. And then finally, Popeye would get to the point, like, if you have siblings growing up, right? Your your older brother just pushes you around, or and you get to that place. I'm not taking this anymore, and like all hell breaks loose. So so Popeye would, would get pushed to the edge, and then he'd say this. It was in every cartoon. He'd say, that's all I can stands. I can't stands no more. And then he would grab a can of spinach, right? And he'd squeeze it and this canned spinach would fly in there. How disgusting, right? And he'd open his mouth, he'd gulp the spinach down and then his muscles would get any, you know, would get even bigger before and then and then what would happen, every cartoon is the same way. He'd unleash a butt whooping on Brutus. Come on, somebody. <laughs> and so Nehemiah in our story, he has the same kind of reaction without the spinach. He, he hears about the plight of his people. He hears about the condition of his homeland. And he says, that's all I can stand. I can't stand no more. And this servant, this slave, this ordinary guy, he draws a line in the sand and says, it's not okay. Somebody's got to do something about this and it might as well be me. I want you to know God is looking for a church of men and women who will do the same. That's all I can stand. I can't stand no more. I'm going to get to my feet and do something about it. And so what I want to do is I want to help us by giving us three principles, three principles of how we succeed as a church, how we succeed as believers in a world of adversity. If you're taking notes, write this down. The first one is, is we must be willing to sit down and cry. You're like that doesn't sound very spiritual, pastor. But Nehemiah was absolutely devastated when he heard the news about his homeland. Going on in our story, it says this, when I heard this, when I heard what was happening in my city, I sat down and I wept. When was the last time that we were moved to the point of tears about those who are lost and headed into an eternity separated from Jesus Christ. Nehemiah had the exact same response that Jesus did when he walked the earth. 
Jesus comes down a hill approaching Jerusalem shortly before he was crucified. And he's looking down and he sees that the people had turned the temple into a glorified marketplace. They had turned God's house into something that it wasn't supposed to be. They had turned it into a social club, a place where, where they could hang out and, 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 and whenever it was convenient, get together and, and not have to prepare an offering ahead of the time. You could, you could just buy it there. And so Jesus, he's looking down and he's overwhelmed and overcome with grief to the point that the Bible says that he broke down and he wept. Emotion overtook him. And Jesus cried out saying, hey, look at all these people. They need a spiritual leader. There are all of these sheep who have no shepherd. And so Nehemiah, very much the same way, when he heard about the condition of Jerusalem and the walls, he broke down and wept. And and here's what I believe. This wasn't just like a single tear coming out. This was a full-blown, ugly cry. How many of you know that full-blown, ugly cry, right? Like, ladies, you know, like mascara is everywhere. It's on your ears. It's on your forehead. Like, this is a full-blown, ugly cry ugly cry. In fact, I remember, I remember Shyla and I, we were, we were uh, counseling someone. I won't say who it was. I won't even tell you what we were talking about, but I've never seen this, but they were so brokenhearted as they were talking and, and usually like tears, you know, kind of, I've never seen it. They were like flying out like this. They were just like, just skipping the whole head. They were just flying out and landing uh, on their shirt. This was, this was like big time, ugly cry, snot coming uh, out of the nose. Nehemiah couldn't even stand up. He was so overwhelmed with emotion that he sat down and he sobbed. And and this is what I want us to understand this morning. This is so important. It wasn't for himself, but for someone else. He was moved to compassion, not because of a situation in his life, but because of something going on in someone else's life. Here's what I believe in. And if you're a VIP here, you can uh, VIP a guest here at 414. You can check out for the next 60 seconds. I'm going to talk to the 414 church family here for a moment. There are many of us here that we are too saved for our own good. We've forgotten what it was like to be hopeless. We've forgotten what it was like to be lost. And the result is we become complacent about the ministry of the church. We become complacent about the calling that God has placed on our lives. What's also interesting as you study this out is that Nehemiah the servant, he was working in a place that was 1,000 miles away from Jerusalem. So it wasn't like he got in the car or got on the donkey every day and drove past something that broke his heart. This was something that might as well have been in that day and age with no vehicles and, 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 and ways for fast communication. It might have been to the, as far as the moon away, but, but Nehemiah, he, he, he gets a burden for this, and, and it would have been so easy for Nehemiah to do what I've done so many times in my life when I hear about some great need, but it doesn't really affect where I live because let's just be honest, I've got my comfortable life and I've got my comfortable home and I've got my three boys and and, and, and I can hear the stories and think, well, well, man, that's too bad. My my heart goes out to you. But but here's the thing. We live in a world that there there are so many problems and and, and we, we hear them and we're inundated. And so, and so we get desensitized to the pain that is around us. And that's one of the, the best reasons that you should limit your social media intake, right? But, but like, here's an example of this. We can, we can read a story about kids in another country that are literally starving to death, right? And, and I'm not proud of this, but, but we'll read it and, I, and I'll read it. And I'm like, man, that's so sad and, and bless their heart. And then I'll, I'll turn around and I'll look to Shaila and say, speaking of hunger, what's for dinner? Right, we, We've all been guilty of that in some way, shape, or form. So many of us, we're, we're, we're desensitized to what's going on. But, but Nehemiah, he did something incredible. He opened his, up his heart to something that was bad and said, you know what? This isn't okay with me. And so the challenge for every one of us today is this, is, is what is it that breaks our hearts? What is it in the world that breaks our heart? And and actually, I'd like you to answer that question. Then I want you to go one level deeper. What is it that breaks our heart on behalf of God? I did a survey a few years back, and I asked people the question, what is it in our world that troubles you? Listen to the responses. The brokenness of our education system. 
how politically correct and div- divided as a society we become. Mental illness, lack of compassion, those who have everything that money can buy, but yet they're still empty and hurting. Abuse of children in all forms, neglect of the elderly, bullying, sexual abuse, domestic violence, human trafficking, godly values being removed from our society, the breakdown of the family unit, drug and alcohol addiction. Listen, I could stand up here for another 15 minutes and list things off. The list goes on and on. Whatever it is that makes us ache on the inside, this is the challenge. We need to open our heart to it. Don't sweep it under the rug. Don't, don't, don't ignore it. In fact, in the old days, Pastor Drew, right, we, we had a word for this, and we called it having a, a burden, a burden that, that, that it moved us to the point that, that it actually changed our countenance. Well, we, we've got to open up our hearts and let the burden that God has wired on the inside of us sink in. And then and, and the challenge is for many of us, this is what we do. We think, well, we'll, we'll see a situation in our world, and we've probably all done this at least once in the last two years. We'll be like, why doesn't anybody else seem to care about this like I care? Why doesn't anybody else do something about this? Let me tell you the answer to that question. The why is because God chose you. God wired you. God gave that burden to you. Listen, make no mistake about it. You didn't choose the burden. The burden chose you because God wired you and put you together. It's deep within your soul because every single one of us in the room today, we were created with a purpose and a plan and God has a destiny for our lives. And so if we'll we'll open up our hearts, God will will turn our misery into our ministry. It's up to us to grab a hold of that burden and say, you know what, that's all I can stand. I can't stand no more. Maybe some of you need to print a picture of Popeye out and, and put it on your mirror so every morning you get up and say, that's all I can stand. I can't stand no more. Somebody's got to do something about the situation, and it might as well be me. Who does God use? God uses those who will sit down to cry and get a burden. Here's the second thing we've got to do. Number two is live with a posture of prayer. After crying, the first thing that Nehemiah does is he prays, he fasts, and he seeks God. Verse 4, it tells us, in fact, for days I mourned, I fasted, and I prayed to the God of heaven. This is a mistake that many of us make. We'll, we'll say things like, like well, I'm just, I'm just one person. What possibly can, can I do? We're, we're just John, we're, we're just one community group. What, 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 what could we possibly do? We're, 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 just, we're just one church in a massive metropolitan area with so many struggles and issues. What can we possibly do? Let me tell you, listen, there's something that we all can do, and that is we can pray. We can seek the face of God. I love preaching the announcements. Today starts 21 days of prayer. Listen, every one of us, we need to jump online. We need to spend some time talking to God. Jump on that prayer service because some of you don't even know how to pray for an hour. The prayer service will guide you through it from 6 a.m. to 7, or you can get it on demand. And then Saturdays at 9 a.m. the next three weeks, listen, this room should be packed out that we're praying for the lost in our city, praying for the future of our nation. Listen, Let me just tell you as a pastor this morning, our nation is at the brink of destruction. And the the United States of America that our grandma and grandpas lived under and our mom and dads live under, listen, if the church doesn't rise up, that nation that we know is soon to be gone forever. I, I remember asking my dad, we were, I asked him a few months ago, we were having this discussion. I said, I said, how wicked must have Sodom and Gomorrah been when we see how crazy our world is today? And God came down and destroyed that. How in the world are we not at least as bad as that? And God said, well, you're right, but there's one big difference. Sodom and Gomorrah didn't have the church in it. The United States and the world today has a church in it. But listen, I feel like we're becoming too complacent and we like to play cultural Christianity. And we live in a day and an age where people need to rise up and say, listen, I'll be a man of God. I'll be a woman of God. I'll speak the voice of truth. 
And so instead of throwing our hands up in despair, can I just be honest with you? Instead of, instead of thinking that the next election is going to fix anything, listen, it's not going to fix anything. What will fix something is when if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then, I, then they'll hear from heaven and he will heal our lands. So here's, here's what I want to say. Instead of I give up, how about we throw our hands up in a posture of spiritual warfare? Listen, I'll stand in the gap. I'll stand in the gap for my spouse, for my children, for my pastors, for my church, for my small group. I'll stand in the gap for the elected officials. Listen, some of the most important time that we will ever spend on this earth is when we see God in prayer. And prayer is so important. Because what we've been called to do as believers, what we've been called to do as a church is not possible without the hand and the power of God upon us. That was the first song that we sang today. We can't do it on our own, but with God, all things are possible. Ephesians 6.13 says this, be prepared. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. How many of you faced some things in the last two years that are far more than you can handle on your own? I could put up both hands and my feet, right? Be be prepared, right? It says this, take all the help that you can get, every weapon that God has issued, so that when it's all over but the shouting, you'll still be on your feet. Listen, you can't buy enough ammunition, you can't buy enough food to stop what's going to come in the last day, but what you can do is stand on the truth of God's word and be ready to meet him when the rapture comes. By the way, before I get people mad at me, I'm not saying don't do that. You do what you need to do. But at the end of the day, there is going to become a shaking. And if we are living in the last days like I believe that we are, we've got to be ready. We've got to be grounded. We've got to be firmly secure in the truth of his word. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation are more than words. We've got to learn how to apply them. You need them throughout your life. God's word is an indispensable weapon in the same way prayer is what? It is essential in this ongoing warfare. Warfare isn't just, well, I came and prayed one time and we've defeated everything. No, no, it's ongoing. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. I wonder if there's anybody who'd say, you know what? I'm ready to let something stir inside of me and I'll stand in the gap. I'll fight against principalities, not in my power, but with the authority of Jesus Christ. Then he says this, he says, pray hard, pray long. Man, that doesn't work in today's church, Pastor Drew. We got to be out in 70 minutes. I'm already late today, right? Like, my gosh, I got things to do today. Pray hard and pray long. And you're like, well, what do I pray about? If you don't have anything else to pray about, pray for us, pray for the church. In fact, he gives us a clue. Pray for your brothers and your sisters. Everything that Nehemiah did was bathed in prayer. 13 times in his story, scripture shares how he prayed. And so God raised up a leader who changed the world because he was willing to pray. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna give away the end of the story. I know that's not good storytelling. We'll unpack more of it in the weeks to come. But, but because of Nehemiah's prayerful leadership, something that should have taken years to accomplish, walls and gates that had been broken down for over 100 years, took only 52 days to rebuild. Listen, we can't win a spiritual war by natural means, but if we'll get a burden, when we'll be driven to our knees in prayer, God will use us to change the world and he will do things that blow our mind through us. We just got to get in a posture and say, yes, God, you can use me. And then here's the third one. Number three, we've got to stand up to act. Stand up to act. Now, here's what I would tell you. The order is important. A lot of people like to jump to number three and they just skip over one and two and then they wonder, well, six months, I'm burnt out, I'm not successful. Listen, the order is important, right? But on the other hand, I also know other people and then they wear out the carpet, right? They're praying and listen, I'm not saying don't pray. pray. Pray without ceasing, scripture says, right? But some people never actually move from two to three. 
They never get to the place where they stand up and do something. They just keep having more prayer meetings. They just, they just keep coming up with the same thing over and over and again. But, but in chapter 2, the Bible says, says that Nehemiah, he starts to, to craft a plan. And so he goes into work. He goes into the palace, into, into the throne room one day. And the king looks at him and he asks him, he says, Hey, you're not yourself today. Why are you so downcast? And he, here's the thing, the burdens that God places upon us, they should mark us. They should shape us. We shouldn't be content just to sit back and, and not be moved. Nehemiah was so marked by this burden that other people could see it and sense it when he walked in the room. I, I remember before, We planted the church. We went through baby probably a year and a half cycle. And when she was ready to do it, I wasn't ready. And when I was ready, she wasn't ready. And we had determined that if we were going to do this, we both had to be ready at the same time. And if I'm being blunt, vocational ministry had beaten us down to almost nothing. And so I I remember praying. I, I remember just, God, would you just let me serve on the dream team? Like, it'll be so awesome. I don't need to be in charge of anything. I'll just, I'll just grab my guitar or I'll, I'll sit behind the keyboard. I'll, I'll lead worship once a month and then I'll let all these other hosers take care of everything else than the other three weeks of the month. And you know, I, I, I never stopped loving Jesus, but I you know, just kind of get tired of church, people, <laughs> bad leadership. Let me just be honest, right? I remember saying, God, let me just go into vocational work and tired of living below the poverty line. Let me just go make a lot of money. Be nice to be able to take a vacation every year. Most years we weren't able to do so just because the resources weren't there. But but I'm so thankful that God wouldn't let me rest in my spirit until I was obedient, until I said yes. And, And now we're able to sit here and yeah, all eight years have not been roses and candy bars and milkshakes and all fun stuff. There's been some hard times, but we're, we're, we're in a season now that, that we look back and Shyla and I were talking as we close the building, just how uh, on the new building, how faithful God has been and, and how much our lives have been enriched by each and every one of you. And that would have never been possible had we not said yes. So Nehemiah, he responds, he says, I love this, long live the king. Listen, buttering someone up never hurts, all right? So there's just, that, that, that's free, that's not in my points, but just keep that in your mind, long live the king. And he says, how can I not be sad? For the city where my ancestors are buried is in ruins, and the gates have been destroyed by fire, and the king asked, well, how can I help you? I want you to recognize that, even, that, that a God-given burden even makes an impact on unbelievers. They'll actually want to come and help your situation. And so with a prayer to the God of heaven, I replied, if it please the king, and if you are pleased with me, your servant, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. I think this is so important to recognize what Nehemiah said. He didn't say, hey, would you let me send some other people? He didn't say, you know, I'm going to sit here and whine and complain about it. I'm not going to sit here and wonder who's going to do something about this. No, 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 no. God has given me a burden. And as long as I'm alive, I'm not okay with that. Not on my watch. Somebody's got to do something about this, and it might as well be me. Some of you like that are theology majors, you know, on the side, you're like, well, that's fine. You're talking about this random story in the Old Testament in Nehemiah. Watch this, Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do what? 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 Works. Works. Our generation doesn't like to work, right? Come on, somebody. We laugh about that. We can get on our soapbox about about that. But hey, what about good works for the kingdom of God? Every pastor that I've worked for, I've 
got a funny saying that I've taken with me in the years since my journey. And so one of the pastors, we'd be out and we'd be doing some manual labor, cutting trees down, just moving stuff around. You know, like, listen, ministry isn't all sexy work. It's breaking pews apart and putting them in a dumpster. It's just grabbing old stuff and, you know, pulling landscaping out and weeds out. That's three and a half foot. Like, it's not all like just fun all the time, right? But, but this pastor used to say, he'd say, son, put your hands on something. In other words, put your phone down. Get your hands out of your pocket. Listen, it's time not to be idle. It's time for us to do good works. And this is what I love. Not just good works, but watch what he said, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Listen, God has prepared in advance good works for you to do. It was always part of his plan. You're not a mistake sitting here today. You think, well, I just, I just randomly happened upon this church. No, no. God said one day there's going to be a 414 church meeting in an old Masonic temple and I'm putting John Tay there because I've got a good work that I have prepared from the foundations of the world for you to step and walk into. And so here's the word, a prophetic word for each and every one of us. The world is going to be changed because you're going to get a vision You're going to be burdened. You're going to shed some tears. You're going to intercede. You're going to pray. And then you're going to get up and you're going to do something about it. Listen, I want everyone to hear my words this morning. God wants to raise you up. God wants to empower you. God wants to use you to change the world. And so our prayer needs to be, God, I want you to break my heart for the things that break yours. And God, the things that keep you up at night. God, God, would they wake me up at night? God, the things that hurt your heart, I recognize that I am the vehicle that you have left on earth to make a difference. If the walls being rebuilt happened through the efforts of of one man, and yes, he did have help when he got there, but what could God do in our church if 30, 50, 100 200 men and women would get a burden and would bathe it in prayer and say, God, use me. You see, in our nation, we become guilty of pointing fingers at everyone. And so, so, so I, I've, I've had so many conversations in the last year and a half, people complaining about the behavior of the kids in our city and in our community. Let me ask you this, and I don't mean this arrogantly, but what are you willing to do to change it? Where are you willing to invest to make a difference? I'll tell you, one place you can get started is in 414 Kids and in our next generation ministry. That's an easy place that you can get started. Some of you are like, man, my my heart goes out to those who are lonely and depressed and and all the mental illness. And and there are so many people that you just meet, they're, they're, they're they're just lonely. We've had a sale going on over at the church the last three days, and, and I've watched as people have come by, and, and they come out with a $25, or 25 cent plate, and they just want to talk because they want someone to listen to them. They want someone to have conversation. Listen, what would, what would happen in our world to say, you know what, I can't change everything, but I can open my home and let four or five people from the neighborhood come around, and I can serve them food and love on them. Pastor Drew, I'll facilitate a community community group. Come on, it's going to start with me if it's going to change. What about those who are lost, far from Jesus? I'll invite them. Can I ask, what are we so afraid of? You've seen them. You've gone into the coffee shop. You see the the distant look in their eyes. They're in the room, but they're not there. You know that they're hopeless. In fact, the Holy Spirit's been nudging on your heart to talk to some people at your work for years and years and years, and you ignore it. Why? Because they might say, no, I don't want to come. What happens if they say yes? What happens if they sit down at this chair and at the end of the service, they raise their hands and give their life to Jesus and God heals their marriage and brings their children back home? What happens if God delivers them from alcohol and drug rehabilitation? Come on, what do we have to lose? What do we have to lose? Heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around. God is calling us today to live a life that leaves a mark. 
that leaves a legacy. And many of us have bought into this falsehood that that the pastors get up and do the ministry, but the, the truth is the role of the pastor is to equip the people for ministry. And so I believe right now God's beginning to stir hearts. Stir hearts. To be burdened for something. And I want you to know that as God burdens you, you may not even know what your next steps are. Listen, then I encourage you to talk to one of our pastoral team members, Pastor Jeremy, Pastor Sam, Pastor Drew, Pastor Jose. Listen, listen, we want to equip you. We want to help you take the next step in the thing that God has divinely ordained you to do. And the beauty is, at the end of our lives, we're going to get to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. There might be some here and you feel the presence of God, but you're not in a life-giving relationship with Jesus. You've never said yes to him. You've never repented of your sins. You yourself, you're not ready for eternity. I just want to let you know there's no better moment than right now to say yes to Jesus. There's no better moment than right now to come home to him. So with heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around, if you're online, if that's you, I want you to just lift your hand and say, that's me. Would you pray for me, Pastor? Thank you. Lift your hand right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hands all over the place. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, Lord, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for what you did for me at Calvary. Lord, would you wash me? Would you cleanse me? Lord, thank you for receiving me into your family. And right now, Lord, I commit my life to follow you. Lord Jesus, right now, I pray for everyone else that's in the room today, those listening online. Lord, that we would get a God-inspired burden. And Lord God, that we'd be driven to action. Because we live in a world that's desperate. That's desperate to feel your touch. Lord, let us be found faithful. Lord God, we apologize for our laziness, for our complacency. Lord, we apologize for getting the, the place that you brought us from. And Lord Jesus, Lord, help us. Help us today. Lord, to always remember that we are your hands and feet. And Lord God, if we will do things your way, Lord, in 52 days, you can change the world through us. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. Hey, why don't you stand to your feet as you're standing? Would you clap your hands for those who said yes to Jesus? I know that the Holy Spirit is speaking to hearts right now. And so here's what we're going to do. The worship hymn is going to lead us in one more song. This altar area is open. I encourage you to come to the front and pray. We'll pray with you. Uh, but let's spend the next few minutes and just let, let God speak to our hearts.
team is available and I still feel the Holy Spirit moving in here. We'd love for you to come back next week, bring a friend, come pray with us on Saturday. Have a great week.